thank you. I must confess I'm uh, a bit surprised and, uh, uh, by, by the large number of audience because I'm accustomed to speak to empty lecture halls. Everybody is on internet, so nobody is in the lecture hall, but your curiosity stimulates me and I, I hope I will not, I will not uh, annoy or, or uh, bore you. Uh, actually, I think I was invited uh, by this gentleman by mistake because I'm not a physicist, I'm a simple physician. I'm no more a professor, I'm a simple practitioner. And uh, what I try to, since I'm here, what I try to convey to you, the me my message is that uh, we have to reshape a little our way of thinking about ourselves and our relationships. And um, you see there are two questions. Can we die of a broken heart? The short answer is, yes, you can, like Obama, you know, yes, you can, yes, you can die of a broken heart, just be sure of that. Who's to blame? Mostly us. This is the problem. Uh, the long answer, it's much more complicated. Despite tremendous scientific progress in the last half century, we do not fully grasp the problem of heart disease. And let's start with the classics. John Keats, in Ode to Nightingale in 1820, said, My heart aches and the drowsy numbness pains my senses, and suffer hemlock I had drunk. Now, you should legitimately ask yourselves, what is this? This is a description of a heart attack? Yes, it might be, because John Keats studied medicine. But also, he died young, he probably never knew that, so maybe something about another human disease, that's love. What's love to do with all this? Uh, you'll see. We do have a problem. And if someone who complains of having a broken heart subsequently dies, of heart failure, heart attack, whatever you want, is this a tragic coincidence or a sign that the body is responding to mental despair? Now this is another way to ask the fundamental questions of medicine, the mind-body connection. Which determines which? What was the first, the egg or the, uh, or, uh, the hemp? Now, the psychiatrist said that the conversion, the conversion, to convert something means if you had a, a, a psychiatric symptom, you are despaired or whatever, you are depressed or what else you want, you convert it to a physical symptom, a heartache, a stomachache, whatever. So, the psychiatrist said, well, this conversion suggests that when a part of the body acquires some mental significance, it can in some cases become the site of physical illness. Yes, it can. In European Union, we spend about 110 billion euros annually on medical care for cardiovascular disease. This is a huge problem. And it's not only the disease, it's only the uh, handicap, the infirmity that produces. So, if personality matters in this situation, can we identify the type of person likely to suffer from heart problems? This is a legitimate question. And the first answer was uh, what is called a psychosomatic solution. And what's about it? Uh, two cardi cardiologists from San Francisco very successfully uh, they uh, had a very intriguing problem. Uh, every, free, uh, every few weeks, they had to re-upholster their waiting rooms. Why? The front few centimeters uh, of the seat cushion were very worst affected. Is this edge of your, of your uh, chairs, you know? Well, what happened? And the solution came from, uh, uh, from their uh, uh, furbisher. He came and looked. What's wrong with all your patients? They all stay like that. They, be, they want to start to a competition or something. Everybody was pushing on that cushion, you know. And uh, they said, maybe they have something in common, all these patients. And say they find the type, type A behavior. Now, what's, what kind of guy is this? It's ambitious. It's aggressive. It's competitive. It's restless. Time urgency. Oh, gosh. Well, get him, promote him. He might be a very good manager. He will make us rich. This is the best man. Well, the dark side of the moon, the dark side of the problem was that these people might die younger. And they found out that heart disease mortality in type A behavior, it's two times uh, more frequently than a type B behavior, a little more relaxed, more introspective, and so on. 
Well, it was a great success. We had the extraordinary explanation. Everything is clear. No, it's not clear. After 22 years, on the same group of persons, the Western Collaborative Study found out that there was no difference in mortality between type A and type B. So, meta-analysis made some years later explains that less than 2% of the variation of heart disease can be predicted by the type A behavior, which is no better than other risk factor. So, the hypothesis was busted. Was this a valid concept? No, because this is a composite behavior concept. And some factors like restless, uh, competitive time urgency are part of many different scales that are used currently in psychology and in medicine. Other factors are clearly associated with conventional personality factors that we already know, like neuroticism and extraversion, and it's much easier to evaluate these two. But we did not abandon the concept altogether, because the only predictive factor in type A behavior is hostility. And you look around yourself and you see hostility in buses and television sets with politicians clashing each other. Everywhere you find a lot of hostility. Hostility independently explains 2% of the variation in peripheral artery disease and ischemic heart disease. And it is a very serious study that was made in Edinburgh and it was on about 2,000 uh, persons in, in Scotland. Well then, let's try another solution the social network solution. Emotional life will impact on the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is a nervous system that actually uh, runs us. We don't control it. No, we are far away in our brain. No, he's down in our body and he runs our respiration, our uh, heartbeat, uh, our digestion, everything is run automatically by this nervous system. And through this system, uh, we do have, anyway, we do have an influence by our emotions. And Jacques Lacan, you probably know of him, was a famous uh, fashionable psychoanalyst in Paris. Before being a fashionable psychoanalyst, he was a, a very clever doctor and a very good researcher. And uh, in 1948, he published a very important paper uh, that in, he described uh, that the low levels of hypertension among those immigrant uh, parts of American society that had managed to maintain cohesive in, as a present of cultural rituals, they had a much, much lower incidence or a much lower percentage of heart attacks and uh, cerebral palsy. So, the most significant variable he discovered is that the presence or the absence of the social contact. And now we have a lot of, a lot of other proofs for that. For instance, support from a spouse was crucial in predicting the survival rate of the heart transplant patients. It's very interesting because this was discovered by a researcher, Brigitte Bunzel, from uh, Vienna, and she actually worked in that famous hospital, uh, AKH AKH, uh, and uh, where the new rich Romanians go to this hospital and transfer their assets to their wives. So they learn something from Brigitte Bunzel. It's indeed very important to have a loving spouse. Uh, another study, much larger, was that in the uh, United States, it's called Rosetto study. Rosetto, it's a uh, um, relatively small village in Pennsylvania, a population about 1,600 immigrants from southern Italy. The death rate from myocardial infection was only, uh, infarction was only half that in the United States in general. The only positive predictive factor was the cohesiveness of the community. Not the diet, not the cholesterol level, not even the smoking. The Italians even smoke more than the rest of the Americans, and they died less by heart uh, attacks. Another proof. Uh, in Alameda County, that's in New Mexico, uh, two researchers, Beckman and Zine, 1979, studied 4,700 and so uh, adults, distinguishing them in four different classes uh, of social bond. They followed them up for nine years. Those law on the scale that lived alone with no contacts, no friends, no relatives, were twice as likely to die as the persons on the first level who had a lot of relatives, a lot of friends, a very extensive network, a social network. 
So, the social relationships are not just buffers to the social stresses, they not only protect you for that, but they uh, as much have a direct impact on your health. Another study, that was that by our friends in Hungary, it was a very large study that was coordinated from Harvard, but it was 12,000 uh, subjects from Hungary. And they discovered that a rival attitude had a higher risk factor mortality than the given by smoking. Distrust, jealousy were the biggest killers, especially for men, and the best protective factor was neighborhood cohesion. So remember what we discovered in Scotland. It was about aggressiveness, hostility, hostility, rival attitude. They kill you, just take care. Another proof. This is from Framingham Heart Study. This is a pillar and the cornerstone of studies in medicine and mostly in cardiology. And uh, two guys, Fowler and Christakis, reopened the, the files of the Framingham Heart Study and they studied uh, 4,700 and so uh, subjects for 20 years. And they studied their social network, how many friends they have, how many relatives in close contacts and so on. And their discovery is very important. They said that the level of satisfaction of any subject depends on the level of satisfaction of the, member of his, of the members of his social network. Now, the satisfaction along with the health status are collective phenomena. So if you have happy friends, you'll be happy sometime later. If you have an obese, fr obese friends, uh, in two years' time, you are, have a lot of chances to become obese yourself because he speaks and does, uh, only eats and speaks about eating. So, uh, they discovered that it was three nodes. If the friend of your friend of your friend is obese, you will, in two years' time, you'll be obese too. If the friend of your friend of your friend is unhappy and unsatisfied, in two years' time, you'll be unhappy and unsatisfied, whatever your real situation in life. So, choose your friends. <laughs> the social network uh, solution, and I'll, I'll close with this because I'm going to bore you, uh, it was a study that was made in East Finland. We have now a growing problem with dementia. Be it Alzheimer, Lewin bodies, whatever you want. Dementia as a whole will be a huge burden to our uh, health cost in all Europe and in America and civilized world. Well, it seems that we, leave, we outlive our brain, and that's a pity. Well, but what should we do? <laughs> now, what did we discover in East Finland? That there is a strong association between midlife marital status and cognitive function in later life. The risk of dementia is almost triple for those living alone in middle and late life. So, it's better to have an annoying partner than none at all, yeah? Well, at least for the heart. <laughs> uh, and some final questions and answers. Now, do all these studies suggest that there are links between the biological body and the political social community known as the polis? Yes, they suggest so. Most Romanian politicians pretend they never knew this for a fact. But, don't believe them, just judge their facts. They buy foreign properties in countries where the polis is very well run. So instead of running responsibly their own communities here in our country, so they are hypocritical, don't believe them. The recent answer is yes, the physical health is related to the way the community is run, so we have to do something as a society to heal ourselves. Another question, is the duty of medicine then to debate the best way to run the police? Well, now it's your turn to answer, it's not my problem this. But, Let's not finish in a gloomy disposition. After all, I don't want to ruin your weekend. So, forget about cholesterol and enjoy staying with your friends. And remember Shakespeare, a light heart lives long. Thank you.